Hi there. Okay, so this is section three of metabolic pathways, and that's key area six of unit one of higher human biology. And we're looking at factors affecting enzymes. Now, this area here is probably going to help for those of you who do your assignment on enzymes. This area here is probably going to be the most helpful one in terms of your explanations of your underlying biology. OK, so we're going to have a look at things that affect enzymes. We're probably not going to focus on pH and temperature because those are things that you should know from National 5. OK, so from National 5, enzymes are affected by pH and temperature. High temperature will denature an enzyme and that will change its shape permanently. Low temperature will make an enzyme less active. High and low pH can denature an enzyme and different enzymes have different optimum conditions. Now, a uh, key thing to pay attention to this on this is using the idea of enzymes being more active or less active. They don't work faster or slower. We're talking instead they are more active and less active. OK, so the enzyme reaction rate, several things will affect it. Temperature and pH, which we've already covered in National 5, substrate concentration, product concentration and inhibitors. So what we're going to do is explore those last three in a bit more detail. For the substrate concentration is, if you think about the substrate, is the thing that the enzyme is going to bind to, do a reaction on and change into products. The more substrate that is floating around in the same location as the enzyme, the more likely it is to bounce into the active site of that enzyme. And so the more likely it is a reaction will happen. And that means the enzymes will be more active the more substrate are around. OK, but. The enzymes are little workers working away. At some point, all of the enzyme molecules will be occupied, will be doing stuff. They can't keep working more and more and more and more. You know, they can't do their job any faster than they than they do at optimum conditions. So the idea is once all the enzyme molecules are occupied, the reaction rate cannot increase. So the pattern that we see with enzyme substrate concentration graphs is starting off at low minimum and then the idea is they increase up to a point and then level off and at the leveling off that is saying that all enzyme active sites are occupied the reaction rate cannot increase any more than that without either changing the temperature changing the ph to something more optimum or adding more enzyme to do more job product concentration Sometimes high product concentrations can cause a reaction to slow down or reverse. Now, we saw that in reversible steps. Sometimes a high concentration of a particular product can cause the reversal of a particular stage, but it needs an enzyme that it works in both ways. OK, but with um, sometimes with high product concentrations as well, the reaction can just slow down overall. And that's because products keep bouncing into the active site instead of substrates meaning that the active sites of some enzymes are occupied, meaning that they're overall less active. OK. Now, other things that can affect are enzyme inhibitors. So this is a completely brand new idea. An inhibitor is something that stops something from happening. OK, enzyme inhibitors prevent enzyme reactions. And there are three main types of enzyme inhibition that you need to know about. So competitive inhibition, non-competitive inhibition and feedback inhibition. Now, this is a really nice essay. If you get essays about the three types of inhibitors, there's so much, so many areas that you can gain quite a lot of marks for. Some of you, your assignment might even be based on an inhibitor. Um, so being able to state whether it's competitive or non-competitive or talk about the features of competitive, non-competitive and feedback inhibition might be an area that gets you points for underlying biology. So competitive inhibitors compete, funnily enough, for the active site of an enzyme. It's a similar shape to the active site in terms of complementary nature, uh, but it doesn't do the same reaction. It's not just another substrate. The idea is it sits in the active site and does nothing. Now that might be it sits in the active site for five seconds or two milliseconds, but the point is, while it's in the active site, that enzyme doesn't do its reaction. And what that means is the enzyme activity decreases as a result of the presence of the competitive inhibitor. OK, with the active site blocked, <clears throat> excuse me, with the active site blocked, the substrate cannot enter the active site. And so the enzyme cannot carry out its particular reaction. As a result, reaction rate slows and enzyme activity decreases. You can re reverse the effect of competitive inhibitors. Excuse me. 
okay? The effect can be reversed by increasing substrate concentration. If you've got more substrate molecules bouncing around with the enzyme than you do of inhibitor molecules, it's more likely a substrate will bounce into the active site than the inhibitor, meaning that reaction rate will actually manage to increase. Enzyme activity can increase as a result because it's more likely that substrate's gonna bounce in. Um, so what we see with patterns graphs like these is with no inhibitor, we see our standard uh, substrate concentration curve. So down at the bottom, we've got substrate concentration, enzyme reaction rate up the side. And what we can see in the purple line is it increases until it levels off because we've got no inhibitor. With the competitive inhibitor, we can see we get less reaction rate, we get lower enzyme activity up to a point. But as substrate concentration starts to increase, the inhibition effect starts to decrease and we end up with more and more and more reaction rate until you cannot tell the difference between with inhibitor and without inhibitor because there's so much substrate bouncing around inside there. Okay, now you might need to recognize this type of inhibitor from its graph. So say they give you a picture that's unlabeled of the graph and um, so they'll just say with inhibitor, without inhibitor and they might ask you is this competitive, non-competitive or feedback inhibition. So you need to recognize, ah, it's reversed because of substrate concentration. That means it is a competitive inhibitor. Okay, non-competitive inhibitors, sometimes known as allosteric inhibitors, they bind to a different site on the enzyme, not the active site, so somewhere else. This causes a change in the shape of the active site, meaning that substrates don't fit anymore. It's usually permanent, sometimes it can be temporary, but normally with uh, non-competitive inhibitors, uh, sometimes they can be permanent. So what we can see here, the red star is our non-competitive inhibitor. The blue thing is our enzyme, the pink thing is our substrate. Without the inhibitor on the left, we can see substrate enzyme fit together, no problem. With the inhibitor on the right hand side with non-competitive inhibitor, the non-competitive red star binds somewhere else in the enzyme, so in this case on the bottom of it, the active site completely changes shape, the substrate can't get in and can't bind, therefore enzyme activity decreases. An example could be lead. It, inhi it inhibits the enzyme called ALAD, and this enzyme is responsible for the production of heme in many tissues, including bone marrow and liver. Now, heme is needed to produce hemoglobin as well as other essential proteins. So if you have lead inside your body, this is bad because it breaks this enzyme and you won't get the heme produced. And this type of poisoning can result in vomiting, abdominal pain, high blood pressure, fertility problems, all sorts of issues. And that's just because the lead has grabbed hold of that enzyme, changed its shape, effectively, I'm not going to say denatured it, because uh, I don't want you getting these confused, but changed the shape of the active site, meaning that it could no longer do its reaction properly. Now, this graph is, an, again, another important one to know. Non-competitive inhibition is not affected by substrate concentration. If the shape of the active site is different, then there, it doesn't matter how much substrate that you fling at that enzyme, it's not taking the substrate, no matter what, because the shape of the active site doesn't, isn't complementary anymore, okay? The reaction can only actually be carried out by the few molecules of the enzyme that are not inhibited. If you've got 100% non-competitive inhibition, you're going to have a zero reaction rate. In this example here, I'd say we probably got about 90% uh, inhibition. And as a result, the 10% of enzyme that's not inhibited is still active. And so you can increase the substrate concentration and you see some activity, but it reaches a point where only the uninhibited enzymes are active. And so you can't increase enzyme activity anymore. Now, this shape of graph, Again, you might get in an, enzyme, in an exam where it's unlabeled, okay? So you've got no label attached to um, the lines except for maybe inhibitor versus non-inhibitor. And they ask you, what type of inhibition is this? Is this competitive? Is it non-competitive? Is it feedback? Okay, and you need to spot, oh, it doesn't matter how high substrate concentration is going, we're not getting any more enzyme activity. So that is non-competitive inhibition. OK, so these graph shapes are actually quite important to be aware of. It would also be maybe a good idea in your underlying biology to be able to talk about what's happening at the graph stages. That might get your marks. Who knows? Feedback inhibition. So some products of a metabolic pathway can inhibit an earlier enzyme if their concentrations get too high. OK, so say you get too much of an end product. 
is the idea is maybe that end product can go back to the start of the reaction and inhibit it. Now, this helps to reduce production of a metabolite or end product. So remember that idea, a metabolite, a thing in a metabolic pathway. So let's have a look at the diagram. And the idea is the final product can, if it gets far too high, go all the way back to the start for enzyme one. And if it inhibits enzyme one, we'll get no substrate to intermediate A, then we've got no rest of the reaction. So we'll get less final product produced overall. And that's a good thing because we don't want too much or too little of a product being produced. So in summary over inhibitors, competitive inhibitor binds to the active site of an enzyme. The effect is reversed by increasing substrate concentration. A non-competitive inhibitor binds to an enzyme, not the active site, and it changes the shape of the active site and it's unaffected by enzyme concentration. And feedback inhibition is made of a product of a reaction. The product inhibits an enzyme earlier in the reaction pathway. There's a spelling mistake there. So it's, it inhibits an enzyme earlier in the reaction pathway. That's a common multiple choice exam question asking you about um, feedback inhibition. So that knowing that definition, super important. OK, that's the end of metabolic pathways. Uh, those of you who got access to the Sway, there's another couple of videos about methanol poisoning and um, as an alternative pathway. And also there are some other uh, things just looking at summaries of induced fit and things like that. Uh, but that's the end of this particular topic. The next topic is about cellular respiration. So it'd be a good idea to look over your respiration stuff from National 5.